So really, uh, oh, there's not an awful lot for me to say, but to ask Peter to come and uh, let us know about Edward Stanley Robinson. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Alan. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Good, jolly good. Okay, right. That's the main thing. We don't need a microphone. Um, can I just, is this plus minus to go forward, go back? Oh, right. Okay. Thank you very much. Plus minus. Okay, very good. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this uh, talk is a progression of a paper I gave at the BANS Congress in Bournemouth 10 years ago, uh, which commemorated the centenary of the 1912 appointment to the staff of the coined room of the British Museum of Stanley Robinson. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman just the once as a young student at the British Museum in 1969. Uh, Edward Stanley Gotch Robinson was born on the 4th of July 1887 in Clifton, a suburb of Bristol. He was the sixth of the seven children of Edward Robinson the first. As you can see, you can see on there, here he is, 1853, 1935, and his wife Catherine Frances Gotch, who uh, they had married on the 27th of April, 1876. Uh, the Robinsons were a well-established Gloucestershire family who could trace their roots to the neighborhood of Winchcombe. Stanley's grandfather, Elisha Smith Robinson, moved to Bristol in 1844 at the age of 27, and with a hundred pounds borrowed to add to his savings of 90 pounds, set himself up in, in business as a paper merchant and grocer's stationer. So successful was he that he made 300 pounds in his first year, and not only that, he found the time to elope to Penzance in August 1845 and marry a, a lady called Elizabeth Reed. And she was a Bristol girl whose father didn't agree to the match as he didn't think the bridegroom good enough for his daughter. None of us do, do we? <laughs> In 1848, the family business was retitled E.S. and A. Robinson, <clears throat> reflecting the involvement of Elisha and his youngest brother, Alfred. The business went from strength to strength. And in 1873, Elisha visited the USA and there acquired, for the sum of a thousand pounds, the British rights in a new machine which revolutionized the British paper bag industry. And he introduced the printing of shopkeepers' names on the bags they use. We all of a certain age in this room will remember when you got paper bags with the name of a shop printed on the side of them. This is the start of that. By this means, the family fortunes were established. Elijah's third son, Edward Robinson I, uh, the father of our subject, joined the business in 1869 at the age of 16. He became a partner in 1885 and retired as chairman in 1929. The business was restyled as a limited company in 1893 and with its factories in the city of Bristol, cent city centre of Bristol and at Bedminster on the outskirts. It was next to the tobacco manufacturer WD and HO Wills, the second largest employer in Bristol city with a staff of over 800. The company amalgamated with Dickinson's to form the DRG group in the 1950s, by which time the international workforce was over 13,000. And after a hostile takeover in 1989, the group was broken up and some of it survived as Rexam, the former medical patch packaging group. But all this is by way of background. So the subject of our talk here was born at Bramford House, 23 Westfield Park, Clifton. Here it is. Uh, into a large, prosperous, non-conformist West Country family of civic consequence. His education began at Miss Cundell's Dame School, where, left-handed by nature, he was induced to change to writing with his right hand. Unlike his somewhat rather boisterous elder brothers, the young Stanley, who incidentally was named after the famous explorer Sir Henry Morton Stanley, obtained what his youngest daughter Corinna has described to me as gold reports. But Stanley did, developed a stammer, and because of this, he, uh, this affliction, he, his father sent him at the age of 10 to live with and receive tuition from the speech therapist and coin dealer Edward John Seltman in Westbourne Park, London, father of the famous Greek numismatist Charles Seltman. Living with Seltman in 1897 at the age of 10, 
Stanley would undoubtedly have seen many coins, Greek principally, um, one would expect, and this early exposure to numismatics would surely have helped in the general cl classical education he would have been receiving. His three elder brothers, Foster, Percy, and Harold had all gone to Clifton College, and in September 1898, Stanley followed them there. Apart from his academic studies, Stanley Robinson's time at Clifton had included a spell in the cricket, cricket second eleven, and he was secretary of the college's rackets club. Cricket was a strong Robinson family tradition, and two of his elder brothers, Foster and Percy, went on to play first-class cricket for Gloucestershire. But it was the winning of a classical scholarship to Christ Church, Oxford, in 1906, and the opportunities that would later open up for him to him there, which steered Robinson away from the business of the family firm in Bristol and towards life as an academic. When Robinson went up to Oxford, he was fortunate to come under the tutelage of Robert Hamilton Dundas, a terse and laconic Scot who was only three years older than Robinson himself. Dundas was a first-class tutor of Greek history, uh, and he joined Christchurch in 1909 for a lecturing post at the University of Liverpool. And apart from war service with the Black Watch, he remained at Oxford until 1957. A very, very long time he was there. Dundas left his mark strongly on Robinson, and the two remained lifelong friends. And Dundas was often to remark that Robinson was his first and best ever pupil. And so it was no surprise when Robinson gave his first class in greats in 1910 to add to the first in honor moderations acquired in 1908. In gaining his mods and greats, Robinson had developed his numismatic interests and acquired his first numismatic commendation, the Barclay Head Prize, in 1910. The prize had only just been established in honor of Barclay Vincent Head, an Ipswich grammar school boy who had joined the Department of Coins and Medals at the British Museum in 1864 and was the author of a number of catalogues of, on Greek coins prior to the publication of the work for which he is best known, Historia Numorum, the first edition of which appeared in 1887. Head had retired from the British Museum in 1906, and so Robinson came under the influence of Head's former colleague and contemporary, Percy Gardner, who, after 16 years in the Department of Coins and Medals, from 1871 to 1887, and a concurrent professorship of archaeology at Cambridge, had been elected Lincoln and Merton Professor of Classical Archaeology at Oxford. Almost 60 years later, on the occasion of the presentation of a festry for his 80th birthday, Robinson explained what this chap had meant to him, and I quote, Gardner was a numismatist by training, and some of his best work lies in this field. He was the first, I imagine, to give regular teaching at Oxford in numismatics, in classes, as well as to individuals. Wherever possible, he would relate the coins to the history of the time. And as I well remember, he always insisted on their importance as a primary source for the study of the ancient world in general. He had to content himself with a few casts and photographs for illustration because the coins belonging to the university, such as they were then, were still held incommunicado in a strong room in the Bodleian Library and similar limitations held for the college collections of coins. In Christchurch, for example, when I, Robinson, first began to catalogue the Greek coins, in theory it required the simultaneous presence of two canons, each with his key, to open the coin cabinet. I think we owe Gardner more than is perhaps realised nowadays. Gardner was one of the first numismatists of a real modern age. This person is very, very important indeed for anybody who collected or interested in ancient coins. So, taking the advice of his mentors at Oxford, Robinson spent the academic year 1910-11 at the British School in Athens, where it seems his inclinations turned away from archaeology to historical numismatics. On his travels within Greece, Robinson was often shown coins which he attempted to buy, often vainly, since prices over there were above London levels, which he evidently knew. One is inclined to think that the young Robinson's time with a dealer Seltman in the late 1890s was obviously not wasted because he obviously knew what coins were worth back then. In June 1912, Robinson was appointed assistant keeper to the, in the Department of Coins and Medals at the British Museum, initially on a provisional ten tenure. At the time, the medal room, as it was then called, was under the charge of a new keeper, George Francis Hill 
who, like Robinson, had been a protege of Percy Gardner and had joined the British Museum in 1893. The two men, one 45 and the other 25, formed what turned out to be a close understanding and friendship based on community of interests and, as Robinson was later to say of Hill, the combination of meticulous accuracy with breadth of view. July 1914 so saw Robinson's provisional two-year ten tenure at the BM converted into a per permanent position. But one month later, the First World War interrupted what had seemed to be so promising a pattern of life. A first-class scholar, lively and energetic, Robinson's connection with the family business meant that he didn't have to worry about the pittance paid by the British Museum to members of its staff. His colleagues in the medal room at the time included George Cyril Brooke, and Harold Mattingly. With the war, this all changed. Hill remained in post. Brooke was seconded to the Central Control Board for liquor traffic and didn't return to the Museum until, until 1921. Mattingly enlisted, but was invalided out in 1916 before being reassigned to the Postal Censorship Bureau, while Robinson obtained a commission and joined the Northamptonshire Regiment serving in France until on the 23rd of July, 1916, he suffered a severe leg wound when German artillery shelled the regiment's third battalion, which was holding a defensive position on the front line between the villages of Martin Puric and Pozier on the Somme. In fierce fighting on a hot overcast day, regarded by regi regimental historians as the first day of the Battle of Pozier, some villages changed hands twice in 24 hours, and two men gained the Victoria Cross. And I'll just go through while we're in First World War. This is uh, Robinson's 1940-15 uh, star and his, and his uh, medals. He lived, you can see he lived long enough and beyond to get the 1953 coronation medal. <coughs> and there's his medal index card showing what he did and what he got. And everything else, and this is all now uh, within the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, where his medals are. Invalided home, Second Lieutenant Robinson entered many months of recuperation, but the effects of his permanent lameness caused by the loss of a knee joint were mitigated to some extent with his courtship of Pamela Comfrey Horsley, um, daughter of the eminent surgeon and pioneer motorist Sir Victor Horsley who was one of the first customers of Rolls-Royce and he tended to drive around West End of London in a big Rolls-Royce, Silver Ghost. So that's Victor Horsley. <clears throat> and he lived on the south side of Cavendish Square in London, at the back of what is now John Lewis. The couple who had mutual cousins and had first met before the war were married in uh, St. Margaret's, Westminster on the 27th of October, 1917. Um, he was 30 and she was 22, as you work that out. It was a very happy union which was to last over 58 years and resulted in six children, two boys and four girls. From 1917 to 1919, Stanley was assigned to the Home Office, but once back in the British Museum, he succeeded automatically, one might say, to his share in the writing of the British Museum catalogue of Greek coins. By this time, the BMC project, starting in Italy and progressing round the Greek world clockwise on the lines first followed by Eccle in the 18th century. We are, we start here, we ground all the way around and we've got to here now. <clears throat> uh, had, it reached the Near East with George Hill's successive volumes on Phoenicia, Palestine and Arab Persia, uh, the last name being published in 1922. The sequence then pointed to, to North Africa as we were on our way round. And it was on Kyronika that Robinson began work <laughs> this proved to be a masterly volume, more of a corpus than a BMC catalogue, in fact, because Robinson chose to include much material not in the British Museum collections. First time this had happened. So you were always the BM, BMC Greek was always on basically on coins that were in the BM. This was the first volume that was not in in that in that vein. <clears throat> and you can see here that the, actually Robinson is bringing in coins from elsewhere. <coughs> and there's more from elsewhere. And the, the coins that are not in the, in the BM, BM are actually Boston, MFA, 
and other ones you can see here. So it's actually trying to make a proper catalogue of the coins of Cairo and Ica, not just those in the British Museum. So drawing on his meticulous and extraordinarily accurate gifts of observation, uh, backed by a patent work ethic, a tenacious memory and a firm knowledge of the historical sources, Robinson's BMC Kyronica, which was published in 1927, explored every facet of the coinage of this self-contained area. Uh, in no less than 275 pages of commentary, compared to 127 pages of catalogue proper, um, he tackled the historical, mythological, religious, metrological, and even the botanical aspect of this coinage. He wanted the coinage to be seen in as wide a context as possible, and the catalogue remains a singular achievement to this end. In the same decade, Robinson was much involved in the catalogue of the Greek collection of Greek coins formed by Sir Herman Weber. Uh, now, this first-rate collection of almost 9,000 Greek coins had been bought by Spink after Weber's death, with the understanding that a descriptive catalogue of it would be produced by Leonard Forrest Sr., the catalogue, uh, which was actually a collaboration between Forer and Robinson, duly appeared in several parts between 1922 and 1929, and Robinson was able to select from the British Museum all the coins not represented in the national collection as part of the deal for getting involved in it. So while all this numismatic activity was going on, Robinson, uh, then living with his young family in Fillimore Gardens, Kensington, was still suffering from the stammer which he had as a child and which the family have said was a deterrent to him taking up a university lectureship. His wife, Pamela, grasped the, met the nettle and enrolled Stanley as a patient of the Australian speech therapist, Lionel Logue of the King's Speech fame, whose practice in Harley Street, London, had opened in 1926. Logue's therapy proved beneficial for Robinson as indeed it did at a later date for George VI. In the early 1930s, Robinson began the process which turned him, as his great friend, the late Dr. Herbert Kahn, the Swiss dealer recalled, into the authority to be consulted on the authenticity or otherwise of a Greek coin of importance. Everyone of significance, from Leonard Forer, the doyen of the British trade at that time, to Jules Florent in Paris, Busso Poiss in Frankfurt, Herman Rosenberg, in, also in Frankfurt and later, later Lucerne, Jakob Hirsch in Munich, Rodolfo Ratto and his son Mario in Milan and Lugano, and even the young Bert Seavey had cause to be grateful for the advice offered by Robinson on coins that, that he was shown. The famous collectors of the day also consulted him, perhaps more, none more so than Kalus Golbenkian, the Armenian oil magnate and philanthropist, described by the late Humphrey Sutherland as the Pierpont Morgan of Europe. Golbenkian had started collecting, uh, started buying coins in 1930 when the Prinkipo hoard of gold and electrum coins of Kizikus was dispersed. And over the next 20 years, he undertook a long series of consultative visits to the BM, adding steadily to a collection of superb quality. Mr. G, as he was known affectionately in Robinson family circles, had a number of standard questions about any coin he fancied buying. Was it definitely genuine? Were its types already known? Was it more or less rare? Was its price high or, high or low? Was its condition average or better? Of these, authenticity and quality ranked highest with Golbenkian, condition becoming almost an obsession. Such was their close relationship that Robinson was almost single-handedly charged with forming Golbenkin's collection for him on the most exacting standards. But of course, Golbenkin wasn't the only rich collector competing for the best ancient coins in the marketplace of the 1930s and 1940s. For Richard Lockett, to name but one individual in this country, had the eye and ear of the Baldwin family dealership when it came to significant new acquisitions. Nevertheless, Robinson's efforts on Golbenkin's behalf can be judged from the unique splendor of the collection in the Gulbenkian Museum in Lisbon today, to which we will return later. With the Cairo Nike volume out of the way and the advancement of George Hill to the post of director at the British Museum in 1931, Robinson's next BMC project would surely involve moving westwards along North Africa to Libya, Carthage and beyond. Indeed, in 1935, Robinson made an extended visit to Tunisia and Algeria keeping a minutely detailed record of sites visited and coins he was shown, 
or indeed he was able to acquire. His notebooks of the books of the time are the subject of a study by Amelia Dowler at the British Museum, so I won't cover ground she eventually will. Uh, but North Africa was to lapse from this program of work because his interests were turning in a very different direction. His British Museum and colleague and contemporary, Harold Mattingly, had already shown the same brilliance in the field of Roman numismatics as had Robertson in the Greek. Authoring the first volume of the then revolutionary coins of the Roman Empire in the British Museum in 1923, as well as being the mastermind behind the standard reference Roman imperial coinage, the first volume of which had appeared at the same time. Though of different temperaments and never of the best of friends, Mattingly and Robinson combined their intuitive expertise in a ma major paper entitled The Date of the Roman Denarius, published by the British Academy in 1932. This groundbreaking treatise disassociated the institution of the denarius coinage of Rome from Pliny's date of 269 BC, and by proposing a date as late as 187, paved the way for the modern studies of the Roman Republican series. Working on it gave Robinson a deep and long-lasting interest in the miscellaneous Greek coinages of the Italian peninsula, and fired him into forming an exhausted collection of the coins of certain mints, including particularly Turium and Velia. The new date structure postulated by Mattingly and Robinson met with wide acceptance everywhere, except, surprise, surprise, within Italy, where academics regarded it as rather an affront that two British scholars had questioned the words of Pliny. Subsequently, thanks to it, the ex excavations at Morgantina on Sicily in the late, late 1950s, the date of the introduction of the Roman denarius has been then advanced from 187 to circa 211 BC. At the same time, Robinson conceived the project for which he is perhaps best remembered and which is still very much ongoing, the Silici Numorum Graecorum. Important collections of Greek coins would be reproduced photographically with a minimum of supporting text so that students could use the raw material as meat for specialist corpora. At the other extreme, SNG references began to appear in sale catalogues, as indeed they continue to do today. Robinson sold the idea of the SNG to the British Academy by convincing them to embrace a numismatic equivalent to the Corpus Vasum Antiquorum, a comprehensive catalog of ancient Greek vases, the first volume of which had been published in 1922. The first SNG volume, published by the Oxford University Press in 1931, featured the collection of Captain Edward George Spencer Churchill of Norfolk Park, Lockley in Gloucestershire, and the small collection bequeathed to the Victorian Albert Museum by the Australian sheep farming heir, George Salting, together with his other works of art. The economy of style in this first volume is apparent from the text. The bearer's description, with diaxis and weight, was followed by the provenance, if known. Very, very simple. There's the, pick, there's the coin, there's the, there's the coin over there, and there's the basic dimensions of it. With the second and third volumes, the project moves up a gear to envelop the important collection of coins of the Western Greek Empire formed by Dr. A. H. Lloyd and his daughter Muriel between the wars, incorporating Lloyd's purchase of Sir Arthur Evans's Greek coins from Spink for £17,000 in 1922. Think how much that's worth now, 17,000, 100 years ago. This collection was subsequently presented to the British Museum in 1946. In 1938, the first volume covering the extensive R.C. Lockett collection appeared, with further refinements in the textual descriptions which, as Robinson said in his introduction, quote, give the maximum of information in the minimum of space. The year 1931 also saw Robinson become a joint ed editor of the Numismatic Chronicle, a post he was to hold for the next 33 years. He was awarded the American Numismatic Society's Huntington Medal in 1935 and co-edited the Transactions of the International Numismatic Congress, organized by the Royal Numismatic Society on the occasion of its centenary in the summer of 1936. In 1938 came another change in focus for Robinson when, on the retirement of John Grafton Milne from his post as reader of numismatics at Oxford, he succeeded to that position. It entailed a weekly visit to Oxford when he would stay overnight at Christ Church with his old tutor Robin Dundas, so he could devote the better part of two days a week in the Hebberton Coin Room at the Ashmolean Museum 
to the private instruction of undergraduates, graduates and dons who wished to learn his views on points of numismatics, which in turn affected the study of Greek history as such. These tutorials, when it is said the passage of time was disregarded in discussion, had an important byproduct in that Robinson became intimately familiar with university policy and the, to him, very great defects in the Ashmolean's collection of Greek coins at that time. Back in London, Robinson had been appointed deputy keeper at the British Museum in 1936 under the Orientalist John Allen. And when war broke out in 1939, Robinson played a primary part in the decision, a very fortunate one as it turned out because the medal room was destroyed by enemy action, to disperse the coin collection outside London. He relocated his family to Kettering in Northamptonshire so he could oversee the move as part of the museum's holdings to Borton House, which is the Northamptonshire home of the Dukes of Buccleuch. Uh, ironically, Borton had been the ancestral home of the Dukes of Montague. I say ironically because, the, of course, their London home, Montague House, had been acquired by the trustees of the British Museum in 1759. By 1941, the coin collection had been moved to Compton Wynyards, the post-medieval moated manor house in South Warwickshire, the ancestral home of the Marquesses of Northampton. Based in a flat there with his family, Robinson was to some extent distant from the administrative routine of the British Museum, yet still close enough to Oxford to visit his students. Avoiding the distractions of war, he was able to return to the coinage of Libya and published an important study in 1943, the year after he, was, after he was awarded the Royal Numismatic Society's medal. He followed this in 1946 with a new look at the coinages of the Samians, Radium and Zankel, which provided a fixed chronological point for the early issues of Sicily and South Italy. Further studies over the next 20 years on subjects as varied as the Athenian currency decree and the regal coinages of Pergamum all incorporated Robinson's emphasis on the importance of hordes, overstrikes, and particularly dialings. The late Dr. Uh, Colin McKennell Cray, an early student of Robinson's at Oxford, who later became keeper of the Heberden Coin Room and who knew Robinson well in later life, likened Robinson's style of working as assembling building blocks into edifices, bringing together all aspects of a particular coinage for publication. Yet in the end, because Robinson was such a perfectionist, he tended to publish only when a problem was completely solved to his mind. So there were, in fact, relatively few edifices. In the integration of numismatic evidence with that of sculpture and painting, Robinson worked closely with Professor Bernard Ashmole, a colleague in the Greek and Roman department of the British Museum, and their first collaboration had been a paper delivered at the International Numismatic Congress in 1936. Post-war, Robinson continued as deputy keeper of coins and medals at the British Museum and succeeded to the keepership on the 8th of August 1949 with the, re with the retirement of John Allen. But Robinson was to have just three years in charge of, de of the department, retiring in July 1952 at the age of 65. It was, by all accounts, a difficult period in which to be keeper. The destruction of the old and hallowed medal room by war was followed by the reassembly of the coin collection in other and temporary parts of the museum, a range of necessity where they could be and not where they should have been. Robinson was able to take decisions on the rebuilding of the new metal room on the site of the old, but the actual work fell to his successor, Dr. John Walker. As keeper though, Robinson was precise, punctilious and strictly economical in practical matters. On one occasion, for example, when a visiting scholar wished to work on coins temporarily stored in a room which at that time lacked the invigilator required by the department's rules, Robinson neatly solved the problem by enrolling the visitor as a special constable. We can do this. We can't do it today, we could then. His achievements at the British Museum were marked in the 1952 New Year's Honours List with the award of a CBE, and the year was bookended with a laudatory bronze portrait medal by Paul Vince, which was struck in December 1952. Tracking back a little though, in the wake of the death of George VI, the Royal Mint Advisory Committee was reformed in March 1952 under the presidency of the late Prince Philip, and Robinson, along with the art historian Sir Kenneth Clark, was among four new appointments. 
The committee was, as one might expect, kept very busy in 1952 and 1953, considering designs for the new reign at its meetings at the Mint or at St. James's Palace. And Robinson remained on the committee for eight years, resigning in April 1960 when he was, 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 when he was replaced by Sir John Betjeman. With all the upheaval at the museum, Robinson had been looking forward to retirement. Already possessed of substantial private means because of the prosperity of the rapidly expanding family business in Bristol, the Robinsons had spent many happy years at their charming country house, the Rookery, at Burton Bradstock, southeast of Pridport in Dorset. In September 1951, Robinson took a long lease from David Lindsay, the 28th Earl of Crawford, of the 18th century country house known as Steepleton in the, in the hamlet of Iwern Steepleton, north of Blandford Forum, also in Dorset. And it was to this substantial property with its little church in the park, its lake and its gardens, which he restored and to which he added a swimming pool, that he retired. In passing, it ought to be said that Robinson knew Lindsay, the owner of the house, well, in the latter's capacity as a trustee of the British Museum, and the two had remained firm friends for over 30 years. In retirement, Robinson became a benefactor of the first order to both the British Museum and to the Ashmolean, although he had been donating fine and rare Greek coins to the British Museum for the past three decades. His gifts to the National Collection had begun in 1917 with two Persian sigloi. His readership at Oxford, begun in 1938, continued until 1958, in which year he became honorary curator of Greek coins at the Ashmolean. At Oxford, Robinson was a benefactor extraordinaire. He enriched the museum's collection of Greek coins by some 5,500 specimens, and in 1964 presented them with the bulk of his own collection. His motive for these donations was simply to have readily available, whether in London or Oxford, adequate material for teaching and research. And the more complete that material, the better. His view was that there was no substitute for seeing and handling the coin itself. If it was a unique coin, then its actual local presence was all the more important. Fortunately for present day students, Robinson was acquiring coins at a time when they were far more readily available than is the case nowadays. And of course, prices were a lot less, even taking into account inflation. These modest images are taken from the trays of hoard material acquired by Robinson, the coins accompanied by their distinctive R tickets. You can see them on there. <clears throat> Apart from acquiring hoards, Robinson bought actively on his trips to the dealers on the continent, particularly from his old friend Herbert Kahn, from Hubert Hertzfelder, from Leo Mildenberg, as others, as well as from the auctions of the time. Electrum coins were a particular favourite of his, and his cabinet of Electrum coins at the Ashmolean is simply stunning. If you ever get to see it, have a look at it. You will not be, you, you will be amazed. It really is. By work, by way of recognition, Oxford conferred an honorary Doctor of Literature on him in 1955, and Christchurch made him an honorary student. But down at Steepleton, and with his extensive library installed in his combined bedroom and study at the house, Sure. Yeah. And, and uh, at the house, Robinson busied himself with ongoing projects, including the continuing supervision and editing of further volumes in the SNG series, the compilation of the Gulbenkian catalogue, which, with the death of Gulbenkian himself, could be treated as a final record of the collection, and thirdly, and mainly, of the planning and writing, ultimately with collaborators, for what was intended as the first fascicule of a totally revised edition of Head's Historia Numorum, the last edition of which had, of course, appeared in 1911. On this last, he worked unremittingly, but his perfectionist style meant that it was never brought to a conclusion. The first volume of the, the, the Gulbenkian catalogue, however, a catalogue of the, of, of the Kalus Gulbenkian co collection of Greek coins, <clears throat> the sumptuous numismatic publication for its time, was brought to fruition in 1971 with the help of Castro Hippolito. Uh, the concluding volume, penned by Hippolyto and Kenneth Jenkins, also a stu student of Robinson at Oxford, appeared in 1989. And this is one of the coins in the collection. Robinson's work at Steepleton was done in a markedly individual way. He would follow his custom, first adopted on the advice of his doctor in the 1920s, to breakfast in bed. Hooray! We all like to do that. 
and so spent time keeping the weight off his injured leg. Breakfast was a frugal meal, always of yogurt, sometimes with olives. Then in the summer, he would spend time in the garden or in his swimming pool, or in the winter, busy himself in his study, working quietly, clad in what Dr. Sutherland remembered as his own version of a medieval burgher's gown, working made for him by his tailor in Blanford Forum. After dinner in the evening, usually with some good wine, he would sleep for a couple of hours before retiring to his study to work in absolute quietness until about 3 a.m. and then to bed. What a nice life. On the occasion of his 80th birthday in July 1967, he and his wife gave a party at Christchurch Hall. And a few months later, his festive volume of essays dedicated to him by a number of scholars who were friends and former pupils, including Harold Mattingly Jr., Billy Schwabacher, Martin Price, David Lewis, Hubert Sreirig, and Margaret Thompson, was presented to him in the senior common room garden. The volume was ed edited by Colin Cray and Kenneth Jenkins. But the crowning mark of distinction, which, carried, which claimed no public speech from him, came at the age of 84 in 1972, when in that year's New Year's Honours List, a knighthood was conferred on him for services to numismatics and to the Ashmolean Museum, Oxford. The ceremony at Buckingham Palace was preceded by lunch at the Ritz, Sir Edward's favourite restaurant when in town. For the most part, his declining years were very happy, surrounded as he was by his family, children, and no less than 22 grandchildren. And although his capacity for intensive work slowed down and he could no longer travel to London or Oxford with ease, he patiently came to terms with his situation and increased deafness. In the spring of 1976, Edward and Lady Robinson left Steepleton to move back to the house at 89 Great Russell Street, adjacent to the British Museum, which the family had occupied since 1936 on the instructions of Sir John Forsdyke, the then director of the BM, in the days when it was considered desirable for senior employees of the museum to live close by for reasons of security. Those days are long gone. And so it was at number 89, where he died a few years later, on the 13th of June, 1976. He was buried at Steepleton in the tiny churchyard, a hundred yards from the house he had lived in for so long, and a memorial service was subsequently held at Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford. And today, his name lives on through the ESG Robinson Charitable Trust, established in 1956, which supports the causes close to the hearts of Sir Edward and Lady Robinson, including numismatics at both Oxford and Cambridge, music and the arts, young people, the environment and conservative conservation, groups associated with Dorset, and last but certainly not least, today's event here. As a scholar, Robinson steered the course of Greek numismatics from the era of Barclay Head, whom he revered, through a great many uncharted areas in which his acute knowledge and observation came to be relied on by so many colleagues and students, up to a new stage in which the comparative study of hordes, dye links, metrological questions, and the parallelisms between the art forms of coins, sculpture, and painting were the essentials. He was, without doubt, the greatest Greek numismatic scholar of his day, as was recognized by the distinctions and medals he received. He was the secretary of the Royal Numismatic Society from 1937 to 1964, and an editor of the Numismatic Chronicle, as I said earlier, but office didn't greatly uh, attract him. When he moved to Steepleton in 1952, Dr. Edward Burstall, who was then chairman of the local Wessex Numismatic Society in Bournemouth, was very quick to ask if he would accept honorary membership. Once Robinson agree had agreed, the indefatigable Burstall then prevailed on Robinson to see if he would chair the annual Numismatic Congress that the Wessex would be staging in May 1953. In the event, Robinson chaired the afternoon session after an intervention from his friend Christopher Blunt, and he also exhibited a spectacular array of Greek coins from his collection. In 1955, the Wessex lost its first president, Sir John Hannam, to unexpected illness at the age of 57. And this time, Robinson, as a friend of Hannam, was happy to step into the breach, taking over and remaining as president until the autumn of 1963. But Robinson wasn't just present in name, though. He frequently made the difficult hour-long journey from Steepleton to St. Peter's Church Hall in central Bournemouth in his, la in his rickety old Land Rover. So what is the one single contribution for which Sir Stanley is still remembered, even worldwide? Well, it has to be the Silligy series, doesn't it? And its personal creation 
the SNG. From its beginnings in 1931, the SNG has developed and flourished on every continent where Greek coins are collected and studied, to the extent that over 90 years later, more than 120 fascicules have been published. It's true that the first volume, conceived when frugality was the watchword in daily life, incorporated an economy of printed detail, but soon the descriptions were being augmented to a level with which we are familiar today. Robinson answered his critics by saying, we give scholars the red meat, it's up to them to prepare it properly. That perhaps is the true definition behind a silly volume, whether it be a Greek coin or indeed any other series. I'd like to leave you with this defining image of Robinson, the elegant and accomplished portrait painted in 1954 by the Chelsea artist, Anthony de Vass, when he was in the prime of his powers. De Vass shows Robinson dressed casually with a blue neckerchief, emphasizing the clear, almost hyacinth blue of his eyes, seated holding a tray of coins at his desk in the house at Steepleton. But de Vass, the artist, wasn't the, Robinson's first choice. Graham Sutherland, brother of Humphrey Sutherland, was recommended for the commission, but his modernist style was deemed unsuitable and the result disappointed. So it was de Vass's study of controlled liveness exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1955, which are fittingly used as the frontispiece to the 1967 Beshrift volume, and the painting hung at Steepleton until 1971, when the Robinsons presented it to Christ Church. Since 1981, it has been on long-term loan to the Ashmolean, a fitting resting place for this icon of the only person in this country who has ever been specifically united for the services to numismatics, and it is now restored to the walls of the newly restored Hebert and Coin Room. Thank you very much. Very much indeed. Right. Um, and, um, Hopefully. Behind you. Hi, right. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, was Robinson only an interest in Britain and ancient coins, or were there other facets in Britain? It really was ancient coins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was that. There were other people at the British Museum who who uh, who specialised in other series, uh, the World Series, Indian. Uh, Far Eastern, British, whatever, but it was Robinson's, it was he, it was his classical education, really, that sort of that centered him particularly down the Greek route. And he did he did the Roman as well, but it was I it was mostly Greek, mostly Greek. Yeah. He did. Uh, I think British, I think the British Museum have have his papers. Um, uh, I don't know that he got that far. I think it was all a it was more a question of, uh, as I understand it, talking to um, his youngest daughter who's still alive at the age of I think she's now ninety two. Uh, um, but when I was talking to her eight or ten years ago, she was saying that the British Museum have all um, her father's papers now, and including that, including the drafts and things that he had. But he was working with others, with specialists in certain in certain series, uh, particularly people like Kenneth Jenkins and other people that were that were more knowledgeable in certain aspects of Greek coinage than, than he was. And he was letting them lead on certain things. And he was trying to bring it all together, um, you know, in, the, in, in, in basically trying to sort of do a do a Barclay head <laughs> if he could. Um, but I think the British Museum do have his papers. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, we're going to run uh, now with a uh, piece from John about uh, Barry Woodside. Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <there we go. laughs> uh, I will have to a glass of water here.
big giveaway up here. Uh, yeah, that was absolutely um, the um, illustrations were brilliant. Uh, I have very little interest in um, ancient coins, but I have a very big interest in the people uh, and, and what they do, whether it's uh, ancient or indeed uh, the sort of thing I collect. Um, aha. Uh, this is David, my glamorous assistant, and uh, I've, uh, I've got him to agree to pressing the button. Um, so, look, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you see what I, uh, I did there. Uh, all very politically correct and uh, gender neutral. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, Barry Woodside's uh, brother Stan uh, in the audience uh, tonight uh, has made a very generous donation to our Numismatic Society of Ireland Northern Branch 60th anniversary celebrations. This, with contributions from others, has helped us fund uh, the lecture evening tonight, our third uh, Belfast Coin Fair tomorrow. Uh, and a celebration dinner in the evening with a welcome drink and traditional Irish music by the McGinn sisters. Um, many thanks uh, for this, Stan. I feel very privileged to make this short tribute to Barry, appropriate perhaps since I may well have been the student friend who gave Barry his first token, which led to his interest with Irish 19th century tokens. <clears throat> Barry has made an immense contribution to Irish numismatics. His collections have been sold at auction by DMW, now Newlands, in recent years. I've done my best to preserve the memory uh, with an archive of his material. But I wasn't the only one competing at auction for some of the rare and maybe unique pieces he had. We are told that Barry's favorite token was this unique, go back one, thank you, uh, James Mabs of Cork, who uh, would have thought, indeed, who would have thought, that an unofficial farthing token would sell for £3,091.20. Indeed, did anyone realise the immense scale and depth of Barry's collection? Well, perhaps we should have. Okay. I did manage to secure some of the more esoteric collections and anyone with an interest in various issues of a uh, rather paddy whack Irish American wood nickels uh, or tokens bearing the name Woodside uh, could have a wealth of material at their disposal. Stan's obituary for Barry appears in several recent DMW and Noonan auction catalogues and is well worth a read. Barry was born in Belfast in 1951. Can everybody hear me? It's American. Nobody has ever been able to hear me before. Uh, but they don't normally say, but this, uh, well, I'm not going with that one. Anyway, Barry was born in Belfast in 1951, the same year as I was, and enjoyed the benefits of growing up in a city, which was still one of the most important industrial capitals in the world. We are told that as a teenager, he was a keen fisherman who took him round the rivers of Ulster most weekends. He tied his own flies, made his own rods, and would torture his mother by melting lead for weights in an old saucepan on the kitchen cooker. This is very unkind, and I know this from personal experience. This particular passion ended when he became a vegetarian. While still at school, the Apollo mission sparked an interest in astronomy. 
he had many other interests, including music and photography, all done, no doubt, to the best of his ability. We both studied engineering at Queen's, which presented its own challenges in the early days of the Troubles. He went on to work in the electronics industry, where he said he spent his day being paid to work on something he'd have been doing as a hobby. I suppose I could say the same about the plastics industry. But his greatest passion was numismatics. This began with the Check Your Change booklets, and of course there was a rich variety of coins in circulation in the 1960s prior to decimalization. Elizabeth II, George VI, George V, Edward the Seventh, Victoria, and occasionally coins going back to uh, great recoinage of George III. And, and even before that. The quote stand at Queen's, a student friend gave him his first token and the interest, obsession in brackets, with 19th century Irish tokens began. This included tavern and canteen, cooperative tea checks, probably the most comprehensive collections of unofficial farthings, and Ulster tokens, tickets, vouchers, checks, passes, etc. Where there were few omissions and many additions to WACB's 1971 catalogue. He also had a sizable collection of Irish medals. However, <clears throat> I want to focus on three groups to challenge the view that numismatics is a rich man's hobby. Well, it can be, uh, but it doesn't have to be. For a start, you don't need to own the coins, tokens or banknotes to study them and conduct valuable numismatic research. Many series are well within anyone's affordable means. First, we can look at Barry's important Masonic tokens, now rehoused in attractive Lindner coin cases. The collection consists of 148 specimens uh, in roughly equal numbers of Mark Master Mason, MMM, and Royal Arch Chapter, RIC specimens, and considered to be an extremely comprehensive group, probably the best of its kind in private hands. Stan accepts he was quite dismissive of the Trolley Tokens collection until he realized how many there were and all the minor varieties Barry had identified. These are next on the uh, list to be rehoused. Many are supermarket or club advertising giveaways and can probably be picked up very cheaply on eBay. An important source of social history for the future and indeed, as indeed, is much of the other material. These are some of the illustrations he would have created. And I think we have some, yeah, close up so that you can see them without the uh, plastics windows. <laughs> That'd be my favorite collector story, which is propped up there now, uh, is the Sparkies. And again, I quote Stan, I discovered that spar Sparkies were meant to fit into bespoke plastic steering wheels available for two and six each. Three needed to hold the complete set, a bit tacky perhaps, not unlike the tokens themselves, but a shame we can't find them today. Stan gave this collection to a friend in Belfast. She noticed one was missing, searched eBay and completed the set. Now that's grassroots collecting. And Stan has retrieve those for one day only, and they'll uh, be on show in one of these cabinets at the back after we have cleared the uh, uh, large uh, Kitchener uh, scrapbook. 
My recollections of Barry at Queen's and our Numismatic Society are rather vague. It was 50 years ago. When he moved to uh, Stafford, we corresponded regularly and I was the beneficiary of various publications in all shapes and forms. Barry was always keen to put something back into what interested him. He began an Irish token corresponding club in imitation of the token corresponding society in England and would print off booklets to circulate amongst fellow collectors to expand his knowledge and theirs. This led Barry to creating a database of Irish 19th century and 20th century tokens. From this, he'd send out paper listings of, for example, tavern tokens, uh, unofficial farthings, um, and many others. And this would be typical of one of, well, certainly one of the letters I received. This was developed into a listing of CD-ROM, which grew into a DVD version. And finally, into the Irish Tokens website, which is still available today. This is the most important legacy of his lifetime work, and hopefully will be kept alive for future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, has anyone Well, I wasn't expecting this. Cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Delighted to take any. Please, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, well. And um, sparkies were given out by the spars, most hence the name. And basically, they're cards on a card stuck on a piece of plastics, and they're dreadful. <laughs> yeah, like you know, I don't know. Stan might want to say a few. I'm not thinking this, but like this is one of the things that this collection is so. Uh, incredibly important for because it's social history. And uh, Stan will tell you how he, um, he uh, used to drive around Belfast and uh, couldn't really get the car into second gear for Barry said, I have a token from there. And uh, really, that's what modern collecting can be all about. I'd love to hear some more credit. Oh, uh, well, look, I just say one way we're, we're going to be uh, uh, entertained shortly by Chris Barker, I know very well, uh, from the Royal Mint. Uh, and uh, I would just say, if you haven't had a look at the two display cases uh, at the back of the way in, uh, and maybe more valuable ones once uh, uh, this was explained, it, uh, please spend a wee bit of time on the, uh, on the way out. Uh, before we put them away and repurpose them for uh, Barry tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Right, ladies and gentlemen, all duly refreshed and a little bit of the chatter. Uh, right, back to our next speaker, uh, Chris, Chris Barr. Uh, it works for the Royal Mint Museum. Um, I've, I've heard some talks from them before, so uh, I think we're in for something rather interesting uh, and uh, rather new as far as we're concerned. I'm getting told to tell you about a book I bought. Um, I, I have an interest or like um, Renaissance Italian medals, and uh, I can't afford any, so I buy these probably after casts and things. But I like looking at the, the books, and uh, I went into Google and Googled uh, 
Renaissance Italian medals, and up came a list of books, one of which uh, was written by Hill, who was featured on um, our last speaker's talk. So I duly made a bid, duly received it, and uh, opened up, and there was a name at the front of it, Madge Kitchener, from HHK, 1920. Uh, now, uh, it had come from the library. I, I didn't know an awful lot about who designed coins at this stage, so the name really didn't mean anything to me. Um, a month or so after the purchase, I was reading an article in the um, Coin News, and it was about the Edward VIII Duckney piece, and mentioned Madge as the designer of the reverse piece. And I said, that's familiar, I know that name from somewhere. Julie got up, took the book out, and there was the signature and the, the date on it. So, you know, what can you do? What can you say? It's, and arriving here, having a lecture about Madge Kitchener, is, 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 it's down at the back there, you can, you'll see it, the book. But there we are. That's enough for me. Chris, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I find it absolutely fascinating to hear you about your book and see the book for the first time. And uh, I'll come on to a little bit more about that because I wonder if HHK might stand for Horatio Herbert Kitchener. <laughs> but there we are. Anyway, um, so I originally gave this talk uh, last year to BAMS, and as with a lot of talks when you start developing them. Um, some weeks before the impending deadline, I still had absolutely no idea what on earth I was going to be speaking to BAMS about. And um, so it was the vague edges with panic setting in that I was very fortuitous to uh, chat to Graham Dyer about a recent purchase which had, uh, we'd made in the museum from Christopher Eimer. And that was this particular piece which is a uniface, uniface portrait medal of Francis Derwent Wood. So the medal is a strong, well-executed portrait of the Royal Academician and showcases the work of an artist with a distinct style. It is by the artist Madge Kitchener and was exhibited by her at the Royal Academy in 1929. As an artist, the work of Madge Kitchener has no popular exposure today. Even in numismatic circles, she's at best a niche figure known by some for having been involved with the design of the 12-sided thruppence that was introduced in 1937. That she has disappeared into obscurity is best demonstrated by my complete inability to find a picture or portrait of her to show to you this evening. She remains a name on a page, an anonymous figure, and one whose artistic legacy looks destined to remain hidden. Despite this, she, has, has, she does have a story to tell, and one that is relevant tonight as she has a keen interest in medallic and more broadly numismatic art. So why did she not make more of an impact? Was it that she was buried under the prejudice of the 20th century or because as an artist, she lacked sufficient talent? That is the question I will pose this evening. And whilst I'll set out my own thoughts, I hope to present you with enough evidence for you to come to your own conclusions on whether her talent was wasted or not. As a start, I'd like to begin by putting some flesh back on the bones of this phantom and, as much as I can, return to her some sense of personality. Madge Kitchener was born in Kasuli, India in 1889 into a military family. She was part of the elite, coming into the exclusive sphere of the privileged white colonial ruling families who in the late 19th century held sway over the lives of millions around the globe. Her father was Lieutenant General Sir Frederick Kitchener, a man who, by the time of Madge's birth, had served throughout the empire. Whilst he may not be a familiar figure, there is no question that his elder brother, Madge's uncle, was. <laughs> Lord Horatio Herbert Kitchener lives on today in the mind of the public as the stern face staring out of the First World War recruitment poster, loudly proclaiming that your country needs you. A controversial historical figure, at best, his reputation has swung wildly from the hero of empire through to his position today of being considered one of the more infamous characters, responsible for some of the worst excesses of colonial rule from the period. 
He was, however, lauded during his age. And at the memorial service in 1917, uh, 1916 rather, in addition to the presence of the king and queen, we find young Mike Kitchener listed amongst the chief mourners at his funeral. By her own later admission, the Madge, Madge's early life was a highly peripatetic one. My father, being a soldier, was liable to be moved from one corner of the world to another at very short notice. So I found myself studying art in Paris, India, Cairo, Cape Town, New York, every important place in the world you care to mention. With the privilege of rank, there was surely no better way of, of an inquiring mind getting to grips with the subject matter. That said, whatever artistic career she was to have was very nearly brought to a tragic end in July 1915. A boat that she and two of the ladies were rowing came into difficulties in Bermuda, and having run aground on one of the many coral reefs in the area, it is only thanks to the efforts of Sergeant Henry Mansfield that she was rescued. Diving into the sea, uh, diving into the water to save the group, Mansfield was able to get Kitchener ashore, but was unable to get to safety himself before being swept out to sea. Picked up several hours later with a fractured arm, he would spend 24 days insensible in hospital, and should any of you be worried, he would go on to make a full recovery, being awarded with a gold medal and a purse of gold by no lesser figure than Lord Kitchener himself. Gradually, we are beginning to cut through the fog of history and we start to learn a bit more about the woman herself. We certainly now know not enough, or she certainly now know enough not to trust her to take her out into, uh, into the ocean in a boat, but we do build a picture of a well traveled, well connected, and undoubtedly privileged woman coming from a very traditional, old fashioned, patriotic family. She herself served as a nurse for the French Red Cross during the First World War. She also appears to be an affable, likable lady. In an article from the Evening News in 1937, the journalist is at pains to point out that she is one of the best liked people in Ashstead. There are numerous folk who drop in to see her. From this, you get the impression that, that she seems to be one of the central figures of the, in the village, a point further borne out by the memoirs of the local vicar, who makes passing comment on her frequent visits to see him. One aspect that continually comes out, however, is her love of art. Described in newspapers of the era as an enthusiastic artist, it was a, clearly a subject that she was passionate about and one that she took seriously. In particular, she developed a deep interest in numismatic and medallic art, an interest to which she paid more than just lip service. So in trying to get a sense of her engagement with the subject, I'm very much indebted to John Rainey in allowing me access to the collection of drawings uh, by Madge Kitchener, which he now holds in his library, and some of which are on display at the back tonight. This has proved an invaluable resource, not just in seeing the drafts of an artist's work, but allow me to attempt to get an understanding of just how seriously she took the subject. This is as much a scrapbook as it is a collection of her drawings, and dotted throughout, we find that Madge was actively adding images of significant coins and medal designs from history. Here we can see a series of postcards from the British Museum illustrating famous English gold coins. On this slide, you can clearly see examples of ancient Greek and Anglo Saxon pieces. And finally, we see uh, that she has cut out and uh, about, she has saved a cutting about the sale of medals, plaquettes, and coins from the Renaissance period significantly showcasing two uh, designs by Pisanello. It's an activity which I believe demonstrates the true depth of her interest and gives the impression of an inquiring and lively mind keen to understand the history and discipline to which she has committed herself. Partly added to by now knowing that she has a book about, from uh, G.F. Hill. Um, as many of her cuttings are from sales catalogues, I also find myself idly wondering whether she actually had her own collection. She certainly has one or two overseas contemporary coins uh, to hand, as we can tell from the rubbings of Austrian coins. Speculation about a coin and metal collection aside, she's obviously prepared to put in the hard yards, and an early interaction with the Roman further illustrates this. Corresponding with the Mint in September 1922, she inquires whether it would be possible to obtain a copy of the illustrious chemist and assayer, Sir William Chandler Roberts Austin's note from the 1897 annual report on the toning of medals. 
The reason for my inquiry, writes Kitchener, is that I am a medalist by profession and I'm anxious to obtain information regarding methods of casting and of finishing medals. I obtain the knowledge of this. I obtain the knowledge of this memorandum from G. F. Hill's book on Renaissance medals. Even from these couple of lines, there are several points which I believe are worth noting. So let's begin with her willingness to track down what is, whilst a significant piece of work, quite a dry and technical read on the production and toning of metals. This is the work of a chemist and reads like it. For a designer to dedicate themselves to digesting its contents is a sign of dedication. In a similar vein, it also shows her wider reading. She's consulting works on Renaissance medals more generally and from an eminent source. As many of you will be aware, and as we mentioned tonight, George Francis Hill, was keeper of coins and medals at the British Museum, where he would later go on to become director. The final point from this exchange that I would draw to your attention is that Kitchener is describing herself as a medalist by profession, not just an artist, but a medalist. In fact, she set herself the rather grand aim, in her own words, of reviving the medallic art of England. So, was Kitchener up to such lofty claims? She certainly came from a good pedigree, having attended the Slade School of Art, Slade, Slade School of Medallic Art, uh, Slade School of Art, sorry. Medallic art had been championed there by the likes of Alphonse Legros in the 1880s, and the baton passed to George Frampton after his retirement. But when Frampton left the school in 1899, sculpture was dropped from the prospectus. By the time Kitchener attended the school, she would not have the advantage that previous generations had of being able to watch medal making in action or study the works of Pisanello, whose medals were so highly prized by Legros. Nor was there an opportunity to practice the discipline of medal making in this country. It had been somewhat in the doldrums at the start of the 20th century. The Australian sculptor Dora Olsen, who lived and worked in Italy from 1902, commented that I may be best described as an engraver of medals. The term may not perhaps be quite clear, for I believe there is not much opportunity for its use in England. Given the position of the discipline at the time, Kitchener had clearly set herself a rather formidable task. If we look at one of her first pieces of medallic art, at least in the known record, it is not necessarily a great start for achieving her aim. This portrait medal of actor Sybil Thorndike as St. Joan in George Bernard Shaw play of the same name was produced by Kitchener in 1923. Not completely without its merits, it's a tad busy for my own taste, and whilst you may disagree, I find it a little crude. That said, it is very successfully channeling the overall feel and style of the play itself, particularly evident in the likes of these posters and images of Thorndike looking wistfully uh, around in chunky plate armour. A bronze specimen of this medal was presented to the actor herself, but what she made of it, we will never know. It eventually found its way into the hands of the Garrick, Garrick Club's collection, having been presented as a gift by Thorndike in 1954. Regardless of the success or failure of the piece, I think it could be agreed that she still had some way to go if she was to revive the, art, the medallic art in Britain. A little help would certainly have been needed in such a big task, and in the 1920s, this might have been forthcoming from the Royal Mint. This is mainly because of this gentleman. Robert Johnson began his duties as Deputy Master of the Royal Mint at the beginning of 1922, and from the start, he set his sights on improving the standard of numismatic art. He firmly believed in the benefits of medallic art, whether that, whether that was in the form of official medals or pieces of a more artistic nature. Writing to the Treasury early in his tenure, he proclaimed that it is only by concentrating all the medal work in one hand that we shall be able to build up a school of artists who will find it worth their while to specialise in the production of coins and medals, and thereby return to the good old times when we could produce not only good medals, but coins that are worthy of us. To help him encourage the development of bright young artists, Johnson enlisted the help of an august body of experts to oversee the design of United Kingdom coins and official medals. The Royal Mint Advisory Committee first met in June 1922 and included the likes of Sir George Hill, who has already mentioned extensively tonight, uh, the director of the VNA, Sir Cecil Harcourt Smith, the art connoisseur, Earl Crawford, and the man whose medal started this talk, Francis Derwent Wood. 
Johnson is intention to encourage the development of the medallic art scene in this country was signaled by the Romans' involvement in the British Empire exhibition of 1924. Holding a public design competition with a range of healthy cash prizes, Johnson wanted to flush out new talent that he could mould and develop. Securing the financial backing of Lord Howard de Walden, a competition for a range of commemorative plaquettes celebrating London was launched and aggressively marketed by the Mint in numerous publications. In a very smooth PR coup, Johnson further used his extensive connections in order to arrange an exclusive with the Times, who gave added weight to the contest by running the piece as news rather than just as an advert. The Mint received a number of requests from the public for information, including from an inquiring Madge Kitchener. She would go on to be one of 81 entries, which were judged by the advisory committee in October of 1923. Beating off the competition, she made it to the final shortlist before being granted a third prize for her piece, Scattereth Yet Increaseth, but the committee requested some changes. The task of conveying these changes was designated to none other than Derwent Wood, and it appears that a healthy exchange developed between the two that ultimately led to the satisfactory completion of the design in the eyes of both the committee and Kitchener. As you can see, the final piece is undoubtedly an accomplished bit of work, perhaps not quite in the same league as, say, Percy Metcalfe, who also, who also came to prominence with the Mint as a result of the British Empire exhibition, but it certainly more than holds its own against some of the other bits of work that were, uh, came out of that competition. Kitchener was delighted with the whim. I am very sensible, she wrote to Johnson, on receiving the news of the honour you have done in awarding me a prize. Further gushing thanks were forthcoming on the payment of her £25 prize money. Thank you also for your kind congratulations. I feel that it is a great honour that you've done me and more than compensates for the work involved. I get the impression that at the time, Kitchener considered this a significant turning point in her career. It would certainly have helped with exposure, the lifeblood of any artist. And her name was plastered across the newspapers when the competition results were announced. In addition, artists who had won a prize were requested to submit examples of their work for display at the exhibition. As 25 million people visited the exhibition, this was a considerable opportunity to showcase her talent. It opened other doors with the Mint as well, her name being put forward as one of several who should be invited to submit designs for a proposed League of Nations medal, for which she would receive a fee of six guineas. In this competition, she was in good company. Edward Carter Preston, Percy Metcalfe, and Langford Jones being other artists, all of whom had or would go on to complete numerous medallic pieces for the Mint. On paper, it sounds very promising, but the cards didn't quite fall for Kitchener. The League of Nations medal project collapsed after the backers pulled out, and in a foreshadowing of later trouble, Kitchener never received a penny of the promised royalties from the sale of her plaquettes. Financially, the project had been a failure and Johnson refused to pay over any royalties as a result, which left a sour note, not just with Kitchener, but with the other artists involved as well. Away from the Mint, the 1920s seemed to have been a good period for the artist. We already know that she displayed her medallic portrait of Derwent Wood in 1929 at the Royal Academy, but this was just one of several years in the decade in which she submitted work. It began in 1924 with the Roman showcasing of her work, which featured her plaquette from the British Empire exhibition. This was followed in 1926 with a case of five bronze portrait medals. The next year, she exhibited a portrait medal of Mary Fenton and the Reverend Canon A.G. Hunter. The problem that I have in presenting this talk to you tonight, which I'm sure is also dawning on you all as well, is actually finding examples of her work to show you. This has been difficult. The five portrait medals and the medal of Mary Fenton have so far eluded me but any suggestions from members of the audience uh, after the talk will be most welcome. I have, however, had success with the piece showing Canon Hunter. And here it is. This piece is not in any museum or private collection, but is the only medal of Kitchener's on public display, albeit as part of Canon Hunter's memorial at Christ Church in Epsom, where he was the parish priest, parish, where he was the parish's longest serving vicar from 1881 to, uh, to 1911. Kitchener and he undoubtedly were on friendly terms. 
She lived mere metres away from his home in Ashstead, and she gets a passing mention in the canon's memoirs, which he published in 1935. Whilst the medal shows that the church cleaner has been a bit heavy handed with the brasso, uh, I'm inclined to feel that it's a very accomplished piece of portraiture. Just as with the Derwent Wood medal, it demonstrates a strong sense of composition and style. I have to admit that I find myself speculating about the potential influence uh, on Kitchener of Derwent Wood. Their interaction over the British Empire exhibition plaquette was certainly brief in the official record, but I wonder if there might have been more. This is because of two points. Firstly, Kitchener went to the trouble of actually producing a medal of the artist after his death. Excluding royalty, the only other members, only other medals of named individuals from her known catalogue were for individuals she actually knew quite well. Secondly, there is the work of the two artists. This is purely personal conjecture, and feel free to shoot down later, but the more I looked at the, uh, the two artists' work, the more compositional similarities start to emerge. Compare, for example, Kitchener's piece of Canon Hunter with, say, these two profile busts of Lady Barber and Sir Henry Barber I would. In both cases, the bust is extended, showing a significant amount of the upper torso, not too dissimilar to Kitchener's treatment of both Canon Hunter and of Derwent Wood himself. Certainly not uncommon compositionally, and it is impossible to form any concrete conclusions, but there are some similarities. This also extends to both Wood and Kitchener's treatment of the female figure. Coincidentally, possible. Reflective of a more general movement that influenced both artists independently, more than likely. At the very least, it does appear evident that they shared some common design thoughts and principles, but the similarities are intriguing. Particularly when you add into the mix another example of Kitchener's work. The design that we can see on screen is for a potential coronation medal of Edward VIII and comes from the collection of her sketches that I mentioned earlier and is actually on display at the back of the room as well. It is a fairly polished sketch and like her other work shows a strong sense of composition. Consistent with her earlier pieces, she shows a good deal of the sitter's torso enabling her to display details of the coronation robes, just as the portrait of Canon Hunter allows us to see more details of his coat and hands. It is a move which adds a degree of legibility to designs, allowing us to assess the sitter and the occasion. Furthermore, in all the surviving designs, we can see her attention is drawn to lettering, which is often sadly an afterthought, and something which I have not yet uh, paid too much attention to myself. In each instance, the lettering is distinctive in an attempt to try and complement the design. It is clear that some thought has gone into it, and we get a sense of this by looking at these drafts, which enables us to see how she has built up, built up and arranged the text. What is particularly pleasing is that we can see her ability to follow a concept through from design to model by these pieces. In this instance, we also have a photo of a plaster model, which she clearly competed with a view to being used when Edward was still Prince of Wales. As George V died in, on the 20th of January 1936, and her model bears the date 1936, it was probably completed towards the end of 1935, although for what purpose, I have no idea. It is, however, clearly the basis for her composition of the coronation medal design. Overall, the plaster is done to a very high standard. It is well modelled and is generally a decent likeness of Edward VIII. It is even more impressive when you consider this model against some of the others submitted to the Royal Mint advice, uh, to the Royal Mint, the Coronation Medal. Even though she was not involved in the Mint's competition, it's clearly evident that her work would have been perfectly at home in the company of these other artists. Even if it's not quite as good as one or two of the designs shown here, it is in fact better than some. So what went wrong for Kitchener? The answer to this, at least, uh, the answer to at least some of this question can probably be found in the competition for the coinage designs of Edward VIII. What should have turned out to be a crowning achievement would turn into a nightmare, one that would appear to materially affect her dealing with the raw mint. It certainly began with a good degree of promise. On seeking new designs for the coinage of Edward VIII, the Mint had advertised in the papers that those with ideas should get in touch. Kitchener duly did so, 
in May 1936 and received a response from Johnson inviting her to the Mint to discuss the proposition. It is important to set the context for these designs. Edward VIII had expressed a preference for a more modern approach, one that stepped away from the confines of the traditional heraldic pieces which for so long had dominated the British coinage. There's no doubt this message that the deputy master wished to convey to Kitchener, but as it turned out, Johnson was actually ill on the day, and it's the chief clerk, Mr. Perry, that she communicated with. Applying herself to the task, by the 9th of June, she completed 15 rough sketches, which were submitted to that month's advisory committee meeting, and some of these we can see here tonight. Whilst they generally found very little to commend, there was a feeling that the simpler figures and the thrift design, which unfortunately I do not have an image of as a drawing, may well have something to commend themselves. As a result, Kitchener is asked by Johnson to prepare models for the committee of her thrift plant piece with a view to, be, to it being used on the new scallop nickel or brass, nickel brass thruppence, which was being proposed as an alternative to the small, fiddly and widely disliked thruppence currently in use on the far side. Kitchener approached the task with a degree of sensitivity to the new shape adapting her lettering to fit the contours to the edge. In a view that I wholly endorse, Johnson wrote to acknowledge his approval, believing the design charming and very suitable. That said, the committee found little to like about the piece when they examined it, although this was probably largely down to the shape of the coin, which evoked absolutely no enthusiasm from them. It was therefore decided to adapt the shape, moving to the 12-sided piece and away from the much detested wavy edge. Not unreasonably, the committee felt that Kitchener's original design would need some changes in order to suit this new shape, and she was tasked with making these amends and removing the inscription thrift. This new model was supplied by early September, and Johnson gave every indication that he was happy with the design. I'm glad to say that I think it looks as if it will be very successful. We shall, of course, ask you to see and approve the die at a later stage. Tooling was completed by October and Kitchener visited the Mint on the 8th of that month to approve the reduction punch shown on screen, which she did pending a very small change to the letter R. At no point in any of their interaction is there any hint that Johnson is less than happy with Kitchener. He even has a developing lettering for, ob for the obverse of the thruppence to ensure uniformity between the two sides. So from Kitchener's perspective, she has no indication of what is to follow. Secretly, and behind her back, Johnson had instructed Percy Metcalfe to develop a modified and much simpler version of her design. This arrives at the Mint in November 1936 and is presented alongside Kitchener's design to the committee in December of that year. In a vote of seven to four, the committee backed the adoption of Metcalfe's simplified model. Kitchener is completely unaware of this development, receiving 50 pounds in payment for her work mere days after the committee had made its decision, and no reference is made concerning the change. By March the following year, she is still completely oblivious, writing to inform Johnson that she has anonymously corrected a report in the evening news, which had the new thruppence as wholly the work of Humphrey Paget, who had produced a portrait of the monarch. Johnson ducks the opportunity to inform her, but his response is telling. Let me know when you are likely to be in London, and I will show you the thruppenny piece as we propose to issue it. By the middle of March, reporters are starting to sniff around her, looking for lines on her design. A clearly excited Kitchener seems unable to resist the temptation to talk to them, explaining her design in detail. Surely, she said, the thruppenny bit means thrift. Surely a design on one side should suggest thrift. I looked around. I thought of the little plant which fringes our shores, the thrift plant. I thought of the way in which it grows everywhere, or almost everywhere, round our coast. So I thought, well, why not the thrift plant as a design for the new thruppenny bit? Despite providing reporters with quite a substantial amount of information, she writes to let Johnson know that the press had made inquiries and that she had sent them away. 
And able to hide the changes much longer and with the newspapers on the case, Johnson makes her aware that the Mint had found it desirable to make another edition of your original sketch, inviting her to the Mint to discuss the matter. I cannot imagine what this visit must have been like for Kitchener. We are left only with a typed statement of her visit, proclaiming in a high-handed fashion that the Mint had found it necessary to change the design in order to meet the requirements of the vending industry, which had created a need for a thicker coin that did not suit her original design. Let us step back a moment and consider this from Kitchener's point of view. Since the October of the previous year, she had believed and had been left to believe that her design, which she had worked on for the best part of five months, would appear on the coinage. To have that cruelly taken away from you without any word of warning and be presented with, to her eyes at least, a watered down version of your own design must have been both devastating and infuriating. Humiliating as well. She had, after all, only just proudly given an interview to the papers talking about her work, explaining her rationale and talking at length how she was chosen. The thruppence, in the words of the evening news, had meant achievement to Miss Kitchener. But that achievement was now being taken away and she was having to accept another artist's work be taken as her own by the public. What would any of you do? Well, she did what most people would have done in this situation and then she brought in the lawyers. Our client, Miss Kitchener, has instructed us to complain of the fact that you're proposing to issue from the Mint a thruppy piece which she had originally designed with alterations which, according to our client's accounts, completely distorted her work. She was, of course, never going to get anything material out of this. The Mint were not suddenly going to about to change course and revert to her design. Nor do I feel that this was ever about money. She had, after all, been paid for the work she had done. It was, of course, a question of reputation. To that end, a statement was agreed between the Mint and issued in the Times, Telegraph and Morning Post in July 1937. Pictures of her original work and the current design were printed, explaining the concept was the work of Kitchener, but the current piece was an adaptation of her work produced by the Mint. Artistically, it seems as if the whole incident did have an impact on her. After 1937, Kitchener's work completely disappears from the record. No more exhibitions at the Royal Academy, no more competition entries, and nor can I find any reference to any form of completed medallic work after this date. The war years do obviously intervene in this period, and this might, in part, help to explain why she is so quiet. Even taking the war into account, it seems telling that by 1939, she's abandoned her studio and shop in Ashstead, having returned to Chelsea, where she's working as an examiner for the British Board of Film Censors. There is one brief, brief flicker after the war, which shows that she had not completely given up on numismatic design. In 1952, when Elizabeth came to the throne, Kitchener submitted inquiries about designing a portrait of the Queen and sent him reverse designs for the coinage, some of which we can see on screen. They are generally a rehash of what she proposed in 1937, and by this point were starting to look a bit dated, and they were not taken forward for final consideration by the committee. I hope by now that I've, given, I've been able to demonstrate that, whilst perhaps not top of the design tree, Kitchener was not without some talent. She had the ability to produce uh, well-composed portraits. Furthermore, she was inquisitive and thoughtful, actively engaging with the discipline of numismatic and medallic art as much as she could. But no matter how hard she might have applied herself, she could not change the way people saw her as a woman. The reaction of some of the press when they believed that she was des designed the thruppen speaks volumes. A woman has designed the reverse of the new thruppeny bit. Thrift plant designed for new thruppeny bit, chosen by a woman. Or new, new thruppeny bit, they are designed by a woman. All draw attention to her sex in a way that never would have been the case if they were designed by a man. It highlights how difficult it must have been for a female artists in this period to cut through and make an impact particularly with the Royal Mint. Johnson, while superficially always being courteous in his correspondences with Kitchener, treated her in an absolutely appalling way. And I find it difficult to believe that he would have acted quite the same with a male designer. If there were some problems with uh, making the design work on a slightly dumpier blank, 
why was she not given the chance to make to, to work on her designs? Metcalf submitted his plaster on the 9th of November for a committee meeting held on the 17th of December. With these timeframes in mind, Johnson could have gone back to Kitchener and asked her to work up an alternative. Yet he went above her head and approached Metcalf, who, by his own admission, was his blue-eyed boy. What I find worse is they did not even tell Kitchener of the change until the following mid-March. Even then, he acted in a distinctly two-faced manner. It was Johnson himself who arranged for Metcalf to produce his version of the Thrupney design, yet in writing to Kitchener to explain the change, he hides behind the committee. Perhaps when you came in the other day, I did not make it sufficiently clear that I was personally very sorry about what had happened, but the instructions I received from my committee left me no option. To others, he is consistently dismissive about her, calling her an amateur in a letter to the Treasury, and it going even further when writing to a friend at the time. She now says that the new design is not hers, and as you told her solicitors, we have never said that, there, that it was. What then has she got to complain of? Actually, she is a foolish woman, since the Thrupney piece in its revised form is clearly very popular, and all she had to do was sit back and enjoy the fame of it. Can I offer any defence for Johnson? Defence, no, but perhaps I can offer some thoughts which might explain his actions. He was certainly, to my mind, undoubtedly a sexist. His treatment of Kitchener and the way he shut out other talented artists of the era, Mary Gillick included, both illustrate a less than enlightened view. Above all, I get the impression that Johnson felt the end justified the means. He did genuinely want to encourage a resurgence in good design, and he certainly developed a generation of hugely talented numismatic artists at the Mint. But it is this attitude, when combined with his views on women, which leads to such poor behaviour. I do wonder if he felt that it might not be appropriate for a woman to design a United Kingdom coin or medal, but his drive to find designs of quality led her to being considered. On a more pragmatic note, Kitchener was a slow designer. She was also not top of her design tree. She had to be repeatedly chased for work in the projects which she was involved with. Furthermore, she wasn't completely frozen out. She was recommended for the Private League of Nations Medal, and her name was put forward in 1938 as being an artist potentially suitable for working on design for the Turkish coinage. But in relation to my earlier point, neither of these are for United Kingdom coins or medals. Ultimately, I cannot excuse Johnson. I do not blame Kitchener for getting the lawyers involved, but it clearly created friction with the Mint. Johnson's bad mouthing of her behind her back to others would not have helped either. She must have felt this stigma. On being informed in April 1952 that her name had not been put forward for consideration to produce portrait models of the Queen, she decided to submit her reverse sketches under another name. As I previously mentioned, they did not make it as far as the committee, but they did pass the initial sift, which suggests there might be something to say about the Mint holding an institutional bias against her. Johnson may well be long dead, but as I well know, organisations like the Mint do have long memories. To draw tonight's talk to a close, the point that it highlights most is the difficulty that female artists faced in dealing with the dismiss dismissive attitudes towards them, and importantly, their lack of opportunity, particularly for official work. Kitchener did have some talent. What she lacked was a lot of opportunity. To those of you who might point to the British Empire exhibition piece as, an, uh, as a counter argument to this line, I have to admit that I've held one key piece of information. Kitchener never submitted these designs as a woman, or at least she never gave indi any indication in her entries that she was female. Her designs were entered under M. Kitchener, and the letter informing her of her win was addressed, Dear Sir. Clearly, some, somebody at the Mint knew M. Kitchener to be a woman from her early correspondence about Chandler Roberts Austin, but I can't help feeling that it would have been a different result had the entry gone in under Miss M. Kitchener. So yes, probably there is something to the question of her talent being wasted, but ultimately she wasn't the greatest artist. She may never have gone on to compete with the likes of those. What she might have gone on to achieve, had she been given more of a chance, however, we will never know. 
Gillick, Mary Gillick that is, after a competition win for the Queen's coinage portrait, could proudly say that she had never been busier. Kitchener, after the barkle that was a thruppence design, seems to have abandoned art completely. She deserves far more respect than she is given, and ultimately, she should not be forgotten. She did, after all, cut new ground at the Royal Mint as the first female coin designer. Whilst that success was cruelly taken away from her, she did lay the foundations for a generation of female coin and metal designers who were to come after her. Thank you very much. Um, that was a really excellent talk, Chris. Thank you very much. I was just wondering, did you think that that Kitchener is perhaps one of the unsung feminists? I, it's, it's, um, Kitchener, so Kitchener never marries. She's always, she always, you know, lives by herself. She always is independent. The thing that I probably didn't get quite uh, across as well as I would have liked, particularly after I gave the first talk through in, in November, was that you have to set her in an era. So Kitchener does come from money and means. Yes, she has some talent, but also she has the means to pursue it in a slightly, you know, dilettante way of the, the you know, the, the, um, a female artist coming from money who can spend her time doing pursuing her passion and pursuing her hobbies. I think she had some talent, yeah, that's for sure. And um, I think if she may, had been given a bit more opportunity, we might have seen more of her. Her sketches are never as good as her model work, that's for sure. So when you see her sketches, they're never quite as complete as the model designs that she produces. She is very slow. She would never have made a good, successful commercial artist because of that. You look at all the projects she's involved in, she's continually chased for, for, for work. But equally, there are plenty of male designers from the period who were also very slow and were left to, to crack on to their, to their own content. So I, I think there probably was an element of the sort of the feminist in there with her. And especially with her being the actress from the joke on the exactly. mm. instead of George Bernard Shaw himself. Mm. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so I think there, I think there are definitely elements of that, and um, and she's she's a com she's a more she's a complicated figure to a degree, I think, and um, I think a, a bit of a feminist as well, I'd say, which is interesting, probably coming from her background. You know, you think about Kitchener being her uncle. Um, clearly, the family see that she's got some talent. One thing that didn't say in there is that when uh, her father dies, she's left some she's left some money and and instructions in the will is that. Uh, the family are to let her get on with her artwork, basically, is, is the the end of, uh, of, of, Kitchen, of Will's statement. Yeah. Your thoughts on how she was aiming at bit too high? I mean, going for the Royal Mint coins or going for the Empire Medal, you know, it sounds like what you're saying wasn't quite up at that level, but she could have been successful going. It's hard to know because I mean the Royal Academy exhibited her work, so she was she she, you know, she exhibited several times at the Royal Academy, and I think probably the best example of her work is right at the start that Francis Stewart Wood Medal is a very very good bit of work, and that certainly competes well with a lot of the stuff. Uh, it, it's a tricky one because I think with Kitchener what you get is a bit of a mixed bag. Some of her stuff is very good, some of her stuff is a little bit weak. Um, I think there there could have been potentially more coin designs to come out of her. Um, but she would never have been, you know, we think about the greats in the numismatic art world, she would never, ever, ever, ever hit those heights. But there might have been some bits and pieces that come out of it that today could have gone down as good coin design. I like the thrift design. I think the original thrift design is, is very charming. Um, so I think, you know, I, I have no problems with her aiming high. I think she hits the ceiling, though. From, from for several reasons, artistically potentially, but certainly from an attitude perspective as well. Let's turn it back. Different opposing. In 1937, that cast was the Irish Punch in 28. When Packington meant because the change from the Irish Free State to the of Ireland, so the first legend was being changed, the opera, sorry, the harp was being changed, as was the, the um, legend. And two of the coins, the, the reverse of the animals on them were problematic. Yeah. So Metcalf went in and, and from the correspondence, he clearly said 
several weeks working consistently with the engravers, with the die preparers, working out how to modify the design so it would work. So when the new coins came out in 39, the, the horse was modified on the um, on the half crown and the chicken was modified on the penny. But that was clearly a result of a cycle of work. Now that happened in 1937 and 1938, in exactly the same era as they chose somebody else to amend her design. So, you know, if, he, if she had been given equal treatment, she should have been invited in to work with the engraver. You know, Which is my, yeah, yeah. In the trial pieces. So it's it clearly double standard. Uh, um, I, there is, there are definitely double standards there, and I think Johnson was sexist, but Johnson was also, you know, excuse my friend, he, he he was a bit of a shit. He, he treated everyone quite badly. Uh, he wasn't, he wasn't, um, you know, wasn't, wasn't above treating everyone uh, really badly. But I, I find it very difficult to understand why they didn't bring her in if there was problems. Why not get her involved? Why not say from the start, it's now a dumpy a coin, um, come in, do this, that, and the other. You know, Johnson had a lot of time for Percy Metcalf. You know, I say referred to him as his blue eyed boy. Um, he was definitely a go to artist for him. Um, so I do think there is double standards there, that's for sure. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, there is. Yeah. This year, but clearly, if our heads were back then, we would have different perspective. We don't mind absolutely a bias, but we would be aware of now that they were. We're not off then. Yeah. And maybe it seemed inappropriate to put a Jackson woman into the workman's room as a mint or something. But That's possible, yeah. I mean, women didn't <laughs> women didn't enter the mint until the Second World War. And even then, when women entered the factory, you know, you've got the factory diaries and you've got in big capital red writing, women started work in the factory, you know, in big bold black capital. capital. Um, and that was only because of the Second World War. So it was very much a, a you know, a, a boys club um, at the mint at this point in time. Uh, you know, prior to that, one of the only positions at the Mint for a woman was some the job title, and this is the actual official job title, was the necessary woman, the woman who made the tea. Um, yeah. So uh, it just gives you an idea of where they sort of fitted in that world. Oh, oh uh, let's start here, I'll work backwards. In 37, she explained the rationale behind the thrift, mm. and uh, I believe in the letters that are here, uh, in 53, she was explaining the rationale between the British Commonwealth of Nations yep. and the shift from the idea of empire. Mm. Was that a common practice where the designer is also um, having to explain their design or was that it's, it's, somewhat unique to her? It's quite common. Um, certainly today, you know, when we do Roman Advisory Committee competitions today, artists will frequently, well, pretty much always submit their work with a rationale behind it. Um, so you do get that rationale coming across, and they do try and explain what they're, what they're doing. Um, some of the designs, even today, do need a bit of explanation as well, so <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Show two pictures of her design of the trumpet mm. and the design of the Da Vinci on page four of the Glory to Six. Yeah. Am I right in thinking that her design was actually produced as specimens because it Look so much like very few pictures I've ever seen of the 37 Edward VIII puppy bits that were issued. There are some, we, we do have a universe specimen in the museum of, of that. I'll oh, skip, skip this and look at it. Uh, we go back. Oh, uh, yeah, the one over there. Yes, yeah, so that's the Uniface model that we've got in the collection. So that is an actually struck up piece. Yeah. Um, but. Um, like I said, I, I don't dislike it. I, I think it. I think it's quite nice. Uh, I think it's, it's a charming design. Um, I do think it loses something in, in Metcalf's transition. Um, but um, they disagreed at the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there is there is a uniface. I think there's even some uniface strikes to this, which I, I think might have been, which have been sold in the secondary market. But yeah, they, they do exist. Um, oh, yeah. Chris, thanks very much indeed. Excellent talk. Um, uh, I think uh, Madge Kitchener was certainly hard, hard done by, as you say. I mean, look at those two images on the screen there. The one on the left is far, far, far superior to the one on the right. Mm. And that should be that should be an issue coin, not the one on the right. And uh, I, I think as you I think as you say, many of us in mathematics these in this day in these days realize we couldn't really have known it back in the day when when Johnson was, was active, but as you described, it was an SH1T, I think he probably was yeah. exactly that back then. 
and his and his word what his word mattered mm. and whether he you know he played with Metcalf or somebody else at one particular time but uh, apart from that um you didn't mention anything so anything like post 1953 do you know what happened to Kitchener did she stay in, in Surrey or she lived into the 70s, 80s, even, or she, 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 I, well, her death is in the 60s, so she doesn't, she not, she doesn't go on for that much longer. Um, but pretty much after the Second World War, she disappears. The only spark that you see is those entries that I can get from from John's um, the book that John owns now. She completely just disappears. It, it looks as if. Yeah, I do get the impression that, that what happened in 1937 probably not not the stuffing out of her. You know, she had her own art shop in Ashton, you know, <laughs> and she was she was doing that for a good 20 years. Um, and then Second World War comes along. She's working as the as a film censor throughout the Second World War. And then she goes to Chelsea and um, and she stays in Chelsea for the rest of her life. You get no get zero impression that she engages with art very much after that at all. She's a, you know, I think it's telling in one way, but it's also a great shame that she just gave up something which she'd certainly in the twenties, and with the amount of material that she was obviously reading and devoting her time to, was obviously quite a passion. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially during that uh, period of inactivity. It's a possibility. It's a possibility that she might have. She, certainly, she wasn't as used as you as you saw. She wasn't above putting her uh, working as um, you know in a sort of genderless way, M. Kitchener, or under an assumed name. I do think that she probably felt the stigma of her sex and felt certainly felt the stigma of the raw mints uh, attitude towards her uh, after that point. Um, but um, yeah, it's possible. Okay, look, um, when I made the uh, comments to Alan about the, the book that he now owns, it was, uh, I had to put him on the spot uh, to explain it in our anticipation of what you were going to say about it. Look, this is really significant. This is the book that she actually referred to uh, for mm -hmm. inspiration. So, uh, yeah, um, I just want to say a couple of things about this design here. And largely agreeing with what Peter has said here. Um, it's very hard to compare designs mm -hmm. uh, now uh, and uh, then as much as we now live in a minimalistic uh, world where maybe the one on the right has some uh, traction. But, uh, if you look at Kitchener's design, you'll see every letter is in the apex. Yeah. Of the uh, the corners mm -hmm. there, whatever you want to call it. Uh, for me, the thrift plant is uh, much more uh, well displayed. Uh, likelihood of seeing three end on flowers is, well, I don't suppose it goes to the sun, but look, uh, I think that that is, and the fineness of the, the, the leaf is certainly a lot more like the, yeah. the plant itself. Um, I really much prefer the one on the best. Sorry if I see the need to defend uh, uh, all the stuff in the back there. But, uh, I, I just think she gave a lot of thought to it. You yeah. can tell she, she's tried very hard to try and make it all work together. Uh, it's quite a bit of a, uh, really, is a, really was a labour of love. You can get that certainly coming across. Um, you also get the initials as well. And we can see um, there's a K there as well. So it's a little monogram of hers that appears on quite a lot of her work. She's buried into it. Um, but um, yeah, no, I, I, I think she really thought quite heavily about it, particularly lettering. She seems to give lettering quite a lot of thought. And she does have quite a distinctive lettering style. So um, particularly with the E's, you see that coming across quite a lot. And was one of the things that was helpful in spotting the plaquette of Karen Hunter from earlier. The E's are very similar. So you start to see similarities across her lettering style on, on her work. I'd love to find the other five portrait medals that she's uh, displayed at the Royal Academy, just to see what her other portrait work was like. Because what you really need with Ketchy Kitchener is a, a wider array of material to, to judge her. Um, it's these infuriating little snapshots that you keep getting. You want a little bit more of her work to be able to join the dots a bit more, really. So. Yep. Uh, it looks like we're... I don't know. 
point to the end there. But look, I would like to thank both speakers. I think that the Constantine talk, they have been talked about uh, personalities and the personalities in their time. It's a time that you know isn't past, it's gone now. So it's interesting to hear that. It was interesting to see um, Peter's talk with um, uh, Robinson. Uh, even those pictures of the Victorian streets that look, always look remarkably empty with horses and carriages in them and these ancient cars, through then to his experience in World War, World War I, on through then, right on to uh, the interaction with the big names, Hill, uh, Bartley Head, and so on. That sort of interaction is something we don't often uh, appreciate. Um, even those of us who do collect some of the good coins. I'm coming on to you, uh, Chris. Thank you very much for this one. Uh, Madge Kachner, again, we've we've looked at someone who came from a privileged background and the sort of background we just don't see anymore, on through um, to the interaction, the fascinating interaction with the Royal Mint and all that, all that discussion, which I think was, was, was fascinating indeed. So thank you both very much. I would like you both to thank you to put your hands together. I would just thank you all for coming. It was about you. It would be a meeting which would not be a success. Thank you all for coming. Uh, of course, I hope to see you all, or we hope to see you all at the, um, the coin fair tomorrow, and then hopefully for the dinner in the evening. And I would just uh, ask, just wish you all a good time in Belfast. Enjoy the rest of your time here, and uh, good night in the meantime. Thank you.